India is ambitious of participating in high scientific and technological innovation. The approach in astrophysics is to lead in multinational projects worldwide. This includes the 30 meter telescope in Hawaii, the square kilometer array or what we call as SKA all over the southern hemisphere and the LIGO India gravitational wave observatory on Indian soil. Dr. Somak will present some of the aspects of the challenges of these ventures and how we are tackling them. Dr. Somak Roy Chaudhary is the director of IUCA, that is Inter University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, Pune. He graduated from Presidency College, University of Calcutta with higher studies, uh, with further studies at University of Oxford, UK. After his PhD from the University of Cambridge, UK, he taught at Harvard University, USA, where he was also part of the team that built the Chandra X-ray Observatory at NASA, for NASA. After teaching for over a decade at the University of Birmingham, he returned to India as head of physics and dean of the sciences at Presidency University, Calcutta, before he became director of Ayuka. His research involves a wide range of topics in observational cosmology and astrophysics. He is a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, Allahabad, and the Royal Astronomical Society, London. Yes, Dr. Soma. Very happy to be at the doorstep of the technocrats, as the, the bill says. Um, I've got, I, I, I wanted to focus on science. So my talk is two parts. So I'm going to topic is rather boring. It says technological challenges, because everything is a technological challenge. Getting up in the morning is a technological challenge. But, uh, so I'm going to talk mostly about astrophysics, but a little bit to uh, want to introduce to you how India is getting into these global technological challenges with the help of industry in India. And that's the where the industry comes in, I'd like to portray to you uh, as I go along. But my focus will be on science. I, um, and the four things that I put up here are actually very important. Um, I have here the 30 meter telescope that doesn't exist yet. It's only on design and it's going to go up probably in Hawaii and India owns, will own 10% of it and is spending about 1,000 crores um, within India. So Indian industry is benefiting from it. 3,000 crores for LIGO India, spent entirely in India by Indian industry will be built in Maharashtra. The SKA, we have a large stake in the SKA and the square kilometer array which is going to come up in the southern hemisphere all the way from New Zealand through Australia, through southern Africa, into eastern Africa. These things will be uh, spread around and India is doing the entire control software for it, being written in Pune. And uh, here is AstroSat, which is uh, ISRO's first satellite in space that has five telescopes on it. And the whole world is clamoring now to use this because this is the only high energy satellite capable of um, observing the universe right now, uh, competitive with the US satellite. So India is already in the big league. And I'll try and explain to you how we're getting into this big league. Right. Uh, just uh, introducing Ayuka in the same vein as ICER was introduced, we both come from the same problem. And it's a problem in India that from the beginning, after independence, somebody high up decided that in India, teaching and research need to be separate. It's the only system in the universe where this happens. Everywhere else, research happens in universities. The same people who do research also teach young people. Otherwise, how are the young people going to know what's going to go, what's going on, what their future is? But somebody thought that it would be good to shield researchers from teaching because then they waste too much time teaching. Maybe Baba didn't want to teach. I don't know what, but this is how it happened. And maybe people thought it would happen for only five years, but it went on. Nobody corrected it. Now, it, it is not true that research institutes don't exist anywhere else in India. You see Fermilab or NASA JPL, but they're all connected with the universities. Fermilab is in the Chicago. Uh, with, uh, together with Chicago University, JPL is with Caltech and, and, and NASA is with Maryland and stuff like that. So actually you have direct um, relation with the university so that the students can come in and see what happens there. This doesn't happen, not happen in India at all. And by the 80s, people realized that this is a, a really stupid system. And so 
um, people started at the same time talking about how to rectify this and from that the ICER concept was, was created and of course Pune is one of the leading ICERs, like the leading ICER in India where research is being brought in as part of um, the education and research active people teach. There are 800 universities in India, most places there is almost no research done. In the expensive subjects, in physics for example, we have particle physics, astrophysics and nuclear physics. It was felt in the 1980s, the visionary Yashpal who was the, then the UNESCO Grants Commission uh, chairman realized instead of giving 800 universities the capacity to do nuclear physics and, uh, and astrophysics, it would be much better to actually have a centralized university, a centralized institution where people who want to do such sciences can come and work. And so these facilities were centralized in the inter-university centers. These are the three ones. There's one on part uh, accelerator physics in Delhi. There's one in Indore, which deals with nuclear sciences and particle physics. And Ayuka was set up in Pune under um, the directorship of Jan Nalikar, uh, a very well-known figure. So that the idea was that people from all over India, anybody who wants to do astrophysics will come here. They'll get paid to come and stay, they have to commit that they will come and spend a month at least working um, with us and a small core faculty, where there are only 17 of us in Ayuka right now in faculty. Of course there are uh, you know, 50 students, we have uh, 30 postdocs, we have a large amount of st uh, number of uh, scientific and technical support staff, uh, but it is a small institute. But our population grows as the year goes on because we have about 200 um, university associates who come from all over India who do research here and they meet each other and this year is the first year in 30 years of our existence that they have produced more papers than we have. And so this is the, when we, we take this as a, a, an index of our success and in most of those papers we are not part. It is the people from Kerala writing papers with people in Kashmir. That's what's happening now. And these are all top journals in the, in, in the world. And this we now need because we have 169 people actually coming and working together. So this is an introduction to my institution and I, I think this is, and you can see now when I talk about India getting into big science, why institutions like ICER or IUCA are very, very important because the connection between, if there is no connection between research and the universities, there is no way the manpower gets involved in these big things and all these projects, it's people that's important. You can't do, do such large jobs with a few handful of people who are researchers. Young people have to be involved and many of these will be built over 10, 20, 30 years and the people who are going to be involved in building and using them are the young people. So that's the idea and the second thing of course India is getting into this is, is India is opening up to science and India has the largest fraction of young people in the whole world, in the rest of the world it's an aging population. So these things that are planned for 20, 30 years have to have a young population coming in. So this is very important. Right, so I'm going to talk about science, I'll talk about gravity, I'll talk about um, how in the new physics we look at gravity and the consequences of Einstein's theory of gravity. And a couple of things I will mention in passing, I'll mention, talk about black holes, talk about gravitational lensing and gravitational waves. Then in the second half of the talk, I'm going to talk about how India is getting into the big science related to these things and what they teach us about the universe, right? So that's the plan. Now that's a grand plan and I'm not going to get through all of this, but I'll uh, see how I, how I do it. Okay, so to introduce you, I mean, I'm assuming most of you, uh, you know, don't uh, get up in the morning and study general theory of relativity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, the basic idea of why I'm excited about it and why I think it's important. Almost everybody here has gone through school learning about gravity the way Newton described it, right? Everybody has done in school Newton's laws and we know that gravitation is a force between two, any two objects in the universe and the fact that it's proportional to the masses but inversely proportional to the distance, square of the distance and so everything is pulling everything else, right? So Newton 
essentially said that is how for example, the apple falls to the, um, to the ground, the earth pulls it, and this is the same reason as the earth falls towards the sun or the moon falls towards the earth and that fall is the same as being bound to or being attracted by the other object and as a result they go around, right. So, the moon goes around the earth, the earth goes around the sun as a, as a result of the same force as the apple, but what is this force? So, in school we are taught and this is one of the problems in school education is that they have to teach things in a very simplified manner and they cannot keep up with what is going on. So, we are, by definition school education is about 100 years behind what is going on in science and people think that they, they learn you know the, the cutting edge of science in school, but we are actually learning what, what happened in science in the 19th century or even earlier. Um, Newton's theory is perfectly all right. In fact, Newton's theory can be used by ISRO to send a, a spacecraft to Mars. But actually Newton's theory cannot be used for your GPS to give you your exact location, right. And that is because Newton's theory is not complete. Newton's theory is a basic flaw in it and I am going to explain to you how that led to Einstein to think about how to form a more complete theory of gravity of which Newton's theory of gravity is only a special case and it is actually not the right way of looking at gravity, right. So, first of all Newton in his theory assumed the space and time are separate things that I can move through space and not affect time and I can move through time and not affect space, okay. And, and so, that is why when we write down Newton's laws as we learnt in school, we think of space and time are different things and we learn of velocity as the rate of change in position and so I can divide position, change in position by change in time and not assume that space and time are connected with each other. Einstein said that that is not absolutely right at all the way to look at it and he did this because he had this idea that simultaneously T t is not absolute which means that if two things are simultaneous in Newton's theory it is simultaneous to everybody else. Everybody agrees that two things happened at the same time because space and time are not connected, but from just this simple example you can see that that is not true. For example, if you have you are standing on a platform and a train is going by you right and you perceive that there are two lightning strikes at two ends of the train right and you see the light come to you from equal distances you think that they are simultaneous, but somebody who is actually sitting on the train will not have the same experience right. So, somebody who is moving will have the light from one of the events come to them earlier than the one from the other and so it is not this is simple, very simple, right. So, simultaneity is not absolute. So, it depends on whether you are moving or not. Einstein worried about this. Einstein worried about this from a very early age and there are quite a few young people here. So, think about Einstein at the age of 13 being so worried he cannot sleep he is being brought up by his uncle, you know I mean his father and mother moved away when he was born, just after he was born went to Italy to live there, left him with his uncle and uncle was a physics teacher, school teacher who inspired him quite a lot and Einstein of course, Albert was extremely um, unusual in many ways and he had a couple of nervous breakdowns when he was a teenager, but he worried about this issue of simultaneity in Newton's laws uncle would teach him all this of course, he is a, a school teacher and at age 13 as the birthday gift to his uh, uncle at age 14, he gave an essay as a birthday gift to, an, to his uncle on this issue. I do not know how many people have given essays on physics as birthday gifts here and that essay was about the following problem, he was worried whether if he travelled with a mirror and he travelled with the speed, speed of light, would he be able to see himself in the mirror, right? Is the light going to go and come back, the reflection, right? He worked about it and he worked up on this and realised that this issue of space and time not being connected is linked through this issue of the speed of light. 
And he came up with this idea even at that early age. Later on, about 10 years later, he writes it in his PhD thesis and publishes it when he was in his mid-20s. The fact that he thinks that the idea of space and time are, are connected through the speed of light. It's a speed of light that's constant, not space absolute, not time absolute, but the speed of light is absolute. And speed of light is the division between space and time. And so if one thing changes, the other has to change in a, in a, in a, in a compensating way to keep the speed of light the same. In particular, later on, he then moves on to formulate a theory of gravity, which is kind of related to this problem. And I'm really boiling this down to a very kind of cartoon nature, really. The whole thing is, is much more intricate. And he's thinking about this. Think about this. So you have gravitation a la Newton, which means that there are two things pulling each other along the straight line, joining them, right? This is what we learn in school. So Einstein, at the age of 14, in his essay, thinks about what happens if one of them is moving very fast. So how does this guy know where he's being pulled from? Is he being pulled from here or there or there or there? Because this guy's moving very fast, right? So how, so, and, and, and the force is along the straight line joining the two. But if one is moving very fast relative, relative to the other, then where is the force coming from? Newton has no answer to this. Newton's answer is that all information is instantaneous. So there's no time lag between this, this, the information about the force coming from this guy to this guy. Einstein said that's not possible. There's a limit to the speed at which you can you know, transfer information, even about a force. So if your gravitation is an invisible string by which you pull, that string has to be pulled the invisible string at a certain speed or at a certain time lag, right? And in, in that time, if this guy has gone there, then there is no way for this guy to know which way it's been pulled. See the basic flaw in Newton's argument, and you don't think about it when you learn this in school. Einstein spotted it. So Einstein's reformulation of gravity, not done in these, 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 these words, but the way he did it was he said, okay, Gravitation exists, but it's not a force which is through these invisible strings. It is a local effect. And local effect is such that if I'm massive, I have space around it, and now he calls it space-time because space and time are connected. Space and time are the same thing. It's a four-dimensional continuum which exists. So space has a character. In Newton's theory, space was nothing. It's vacuum. In Einstein's theory, space-time is a thing, and we are embedded in it, right? This theory is 100 years old. They don't teach us in school, right? And we, if I'm massive, what I do is I bend the space-time around me. And the more massive you are, the more you bend it. So here's the sun, and it bends the space-time around it, and here's the earth, and it also bends the space-time around it, but you don't see it much. And of course, you are on the Earth. You are also bending space-time around you, but that's minuscule. Now, the Earth goes around the sun because the space-time around has been bent so much that the Earth is trapped. In it. So think about it. You hold a big sheet of, you know, your bed sheet, and you put a heavy thing in front. It just bends it, and you throw a little marble in there. And it's going to get trapped in it, and it's going to go around. So here, you've just dispensed off all your long-range force kind of ideas. No problem there. You, know, you do not worry about whether this guy knows about that guy and stuff like that. It's local. My space-time around me is bent. I'm trapped. Right? So this Earth is moving around here because this space allows it to only move around in there. OK. Now, it's a very simple idea. And it works. Now I know because it just gives a little bit extra to our notion of gravity as you had worked through with Newton's formula. Because space-time is also bent, so if, for example, light goes around space, it has also to bend because it always follows the contour of space-time. So I said GPS actually proves that the way Einstein works, Einstein's idea, better than Newton's idea because 
if you worked out the time taken for the signal to go to a satellite and come back and locate you by triangulation that you do in GPS, if you just use Newton, Newton's formula, you'd be out by half a kilometer or so, right? Instead of Hinjewadi, I would be in Pune. But Einstein actually, Einstein's formula tells you how space time is bent between here and the satellite and you can work out with the relativistic correction and it gives you the exact space. So we are using every day in our phones Einstein's correction to gravity without you knowing it. So there are consequences. <coughs> there are consequences to this theory which Einstein predicted. One, the prediction is light will bend if it passes by massive objects. Right? In Newton's theory, light cannot bend. Light is a massless thing. And light, they, gravity can't act on light. So that was the first test of Einstein's theory that would tell you whether Einstein is right or not. The second is that if this is true and space time is a thing, if I walk around here, I'm going to perturb space time and there'll be ripples that will go along in space time. And these are the gravitational waves. So I'll talk about both of these things. And I'll show that over the 100 years since Einstein's theory was formulated and predicted, all these things we have managed to measure and describe and, and, and show that Einstein's way of looking at gravity is now, of course, much more valid than Newton's way of looking at gravity. That has huge consequences in terms of, of everything that we use. So Einstein's idea is mass bent space, and light follows the shortest path always follows the shortest path in space. So, if you have a star or a massive object, then light as passing through will bend because it's the locally the space is bent. But if you have a star there and an astronomer there, our eyes can't follow a bent path. So the astronomer will see the star there. The star is actually here. The astronomer will see the star there. Right? Directly verifiable. Newton's theory does not say light can bend. So <clears throat> you have these stars and then you put the sun in the middle, say. So you have four stars in the sky and you have the sun right in the middle. So if you are seeing them behind the sun, just the sun's gravity should pull the light in and you should see them somewhere else. Except that it is very difficult to do this because the sun, when the sun is in the middle, it's the daytime and you don't see stars. So, somebody, you know, picked it up very fast. 1915, Einstein's theory of relativity was published. 1919, Arthur Stanley Eddington from Cambridge, you know, it took them a while to actually get Einstein's paper because it was published in Germany, in German, 1915, in the middle of the Second World War. German journals did not go to England. They came to India first. Actually, it was first translated by Shottin Bosch and, and, and uh, Mengnath Saha in Calcutta into English. That's the first English translation. And from India, it went to England. So the first translation of Einstein's paper came from India. It's publicized in the world, 18. The war is over. Then people in Oxford and Cambridge get to read it. And <coughs> Eddington said, let's try and observe stars during an eclipse. Very easy. So, Eddington found that there was an eclipse in 1919 off the coast of Western Africa, off the island of Principe. They are next year celebrating 100 years of this experiment. Um, it's a small island. He packed a telescope. He'd never observed in his life. He's a mathematician, theoretical astronomer. He got a couple of other Cambridge astronomers to go with him, went on this voyage of the coast of Western Africa. And this is his hand-drawn you know, thing where what they did was they took pictures of the stars around the sun as the sun was being blocked by the moon. Okay? Six months later, in the middle of the night, they took a picture of the same place where there's no sun. And they found that during the eclipse, the stars had been displaced just like predicted. So this, within five, four years of publication of Newton's, uh, Einstein's theory, it was conclusively shown that according to Newton, this wouldn't have happened. So they published this. Of course, somebody told Einstein. Einstein was very, very happy. He wrote a letter to his mother on a postcard 
Lieber Mutter, us, an English guy has gone and proved my theory. Right? I, you know, not many of us like to our mothers when such things happen. <laughs> but Einstein was unusual. So this was the first indication that really this guy who came from outside, he didn't come from academia. He, as you know, worked in industry for a long time and then published his theory when he was actually working in a patent office. Um, slowly got recognition that he was on the right track and he had rewritten the rules of gravity. Here's another aspect of this. What now we do is, of course, Einstein then said, you know, this is a very small effect. It's very difficult to do this. In the 60s, we started measuring with large telescopes an effect as a, which is a direct result of this. So you know, if anything passes by a massive object and gets bent, then by definition, almost everything we observe has to be distorted. Almost everything we see has to be somewhere else. And everything is a mirage, and that's absolutely true. So for example, here's a, a, a picture, a, a very well-known place in, in Cambridge, the King's, King's College Chapel. And uh, a friend of mine who works in Cambridge produced this picture. That's why it's come from that. And if you see it from the, the river, it's like this. And then if you have an invisible blob right in front of it, the size of a star or the mass of a star, then it will look like this. Because what will happen is different parts of it, the light will come to you in different parts. And you look, look at it in a distorted fashion. This is what happens. So you're observing something. Here's the sky, all these stars in there. And the light comes, and it bends around this invisible mass. So even if you don't see the matter, in the, and most of the matter in the universe you don't see, because it doesn't emit light, you will see it as a distortion of the background field. And this was predicted in the 40s, in the 50s. And everybody said, of course, this is very, is very difficult to see. And then in the mid-60s, the first such thing was discovered, the gravitational lens. And what happens is that if you have a star or a galaxy right, in the, right behind a massive object, like a galaxy or a cluster of galaxies, then the light that comes through it is going to be bent like that and come to you. But of course, it can bend like that and come to you. It can bend like that and come to you. And in the end, you can see multiple images of the same thing. So here's an object for which you see four images of the same thing. It's very easy to prove that they're the same thing, because you can take a spectrum of, that, of it. And spectra are like fingerprints. Very few things adjacent to each other have exactly the same spectrum. These four have identical. The other interesting thing is nothing in the universe is constant. So they vary in, 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 uh, in, in light. Something happens. So because they are coming to you in four different paths, when one, one of these varies, a few months later, you see another vary. And another varies. So in this particular system, the time delay of the variations between this and this is 420 days. This has also been measured. So we know that such things can happen. And not only that, what can also happen is that you see things in background of massive objects in highly distorted ways. So here are good examples of these things. For example, this is a, one of my favorite Hubble Space Telescope pictures of a cluster of galaxies. These galaxies are in the foreground. Those are in the background. Those streaks are actually galaxies like this. But you're seeing them because they're distorted like the King's College Chapel. And in this particular case, for example, that galaxy, that galaxy, and that galaxy are the same galaxy you're seeing in four three different places. And you can establish that. And I've had students who've done their PhD thesis on this, modeling this, and trying to find out what kind of matter exists. In this, uh, in this cluster of galaxies, and most of it's dark. And you can actually measure this kind of stuff. So you can see these amazing little features. And these are, actually, this galaxy is something like that. But you are seeing it as, as, a, as an illusion. You're seeing it stretched out and bent because the light that comes from it comes on the way to you, being bent in bent space. So that should blow your mind if you haven't thought of it before. So what can lensing do for us? One of the things that it does for us is that actually, in the process of doing this, it also magnifies objects. So we are now finding the faintest objects in the universe and the most faraway objects in the universe with the help of this telescope, which is the universe. Because <laughs> the universe is magnifying things for us. right? So gravitational lensing is actually like an optical lens on a huge scale, millions of light years long. So there, 
another consequence of gravity and I just wrote it down here for you and this is what you are taught in school. Go back to Newton, this way Newton, Newton is, Newton's formulation is all right, Newton's formulae work. It is only when you get to things that are going very fast or going near very massive objects, the departure from Newton into Einstein's formulation becomes important, right. And that is why I said you can design a spacecraft to go to Mars with just the Newtonian formulation, nothing will happen. But if you try to predict the, prob, uh, the orbit of Mercury, which is so close to the sun, you, have, you start having a problem. In Earth, not a problem at all. So I can use Newton's idea to describe what a black hole is to you. It's not a problem. I'll tell you in, in the end how Einstein would do it. But I think the basic idea of black holes comes from Newton. In, in fact, after Newton, uh, people had already started thinking about black holes. So Newton gives you this idea of the gravity being a force that pulls you, Earth's gravity pulls me. And so for everything, there is something called the escape velocity, right? And so this means that you need to get to a certain velocity to escape from the gravity of a certain object, right? And that's why when I jump up, I come down, I can never escape the gravity of the Earth, but a rocket can, right? So very simple thing that everybody learns in school is V squared is 2 gm over r, where m is the size the mass of the object, the earth in this case, and r is the radius. And if you have m over r, that tells you that the escape velocity from it will be given by this equation, very simple. Now note that it is m over r. So if something is much bigger, so the idea is that the, so after Newton, one could easily define a black hole except for the, this formulation has to be slightly different. That if, for example, you know that the highest speed possible is the speed of light, then you cannot escape from an object if the escape velocity is larger than the speed of light. So that's your definition of a black hole from Newton. Except that to work that out, it will require Einstein's formulation. But the idea is already here. So how can the escape velocity be as high as the speed of light? Because you can either do this by increasing the mass of something, you can, you can go to bigger and bigger things, mass, bigger in sense of more massive things. And what will happen is that if a planet of a certain size has more and more mass, its escape velocity is going to be higher and higher and you will find it increasingly difficult to jump on it. And you won't be able to jump too high, right? And so the escape velocity is going to get higher and higher because that m increases. On the other hand, your, um, what, you, what can happen is that your, your, your r can decrease too. So keep the mass the same, but you can squeeze it into smaller and smaller r, and the same effect will happen. And you can hit a certain r, radius, at which your escape velocity will exceed the speed of light. So theoretically, according to that formula, everything, including you, can be turned into a black hole, right? So I wanted to, I, I put down a few things to tell you before getting into the details. A lot of people think that, you know, uh, because of science fiction and badly written science fiction, that black holes are everywhere, they're coming to get you and anything can be turned into a black hole. Yes, anything can be turned into a black hole, but it requires a lot of energy to do that. And black holes are not everywhere because, and they, they can be everywhere, but their effect is not very widespread. For example, and I've written it there, that if the sun today turned into a black hole, the earth will not feel it. Because its effect only goes up about the orbit of Mercury or something, right? Not much more than that. Of course, if the sun turns into a black hole today, it will turn very dark, right? But that's all. But the Earth will go around in the same orbit. It's not going to fall into the, into the sun, as most science fiction you know, um, films show you, all the planets falling into the black hole or whatever. That doesn't happen, okay? The black holes are very nice little beasts. If you stay away from them, a little away from them, they're okay. But I'll show you what they can do. Here is, so what happens, you can, you can make escape difficult by decreasing the radius. And so even after Newton, we knew that there could be these dark stars. And uh, if you make this, the, anything with a mass m, according to this formula, having a certain radius, which is 2 gm over c squared, c being the speed of light, then light cannot escape from it. Okay, it's called the Schwarzschild radius. For the Earth mass, that turns out to be less than a centimeter. So try squeezing the Earth to something smaller than a centimeter, 
that is not easy. And so, then you read headlines saying, in CERN something will happen and the whole earth will turn into a black hole. That is not possible. And to make you into a black hole is even more difficult, because then this will be like, you know, 0.9, I do not know, micrometers. But the sun, if one can squeeze and turn into, you know, something that is of the size of 3 kilometers, then it will turn into a black hole. And that is possible. It would not happen for the sun, but it happened for the stars, because stars are held up by the light they produce due to nuclear reactions in the middle. When the fuel finishes, there is nothing to hold up the star, and the stars can collapse and form into these things. And that is what Chandrasekhar showed us in the 1930s. This is why it is difficult to measure and detect black holes, because that is what a black hole looks like. Why? Because nothing comes out of it. We detect everything in the universe through light up to now, except for in the last three years when we have started detecting things through their gravity. I will come to that in a minute. But we detect everything through light. By definition, I have given you the definition of black hole, nothing can escape. Right? So, nothing can come out of a black hole. So, you cannot, in theory, detect a black hole. And this led to this great debate between many people, including Hawking got into this. Hawking bet uh, various people. There were famous wagers set in the 1970s, 80s about whether black holes can ever be detected. And in the end, even Hawking conceded in the 1990s that we have found black holes. That is because these are so extreme that they are impossible to hide. I just told you, anything massive distorts space time around it. A black hole will distort space time so much that very high energy events will happen around it. And this is what can happen. So, this is how a black hole can form very easily. Most stars in the universe are in binary systems, right? That there are two stars going around each other. Actually, in our solar system, that is not true. And that is because Jupiter almost became a star, it could not. Otherwise, we would have had two suns in the sky, but most planets will have two suns in the sky, right? More than 50 percent of stars in our galaxy are in binary systems. So, and they are unequal. Very, it would be coincidence if they are, they are exactly equal. So, if there are two stars, one of them is bigger than the other, the bigger stars evolve faster. So, this guy will evolve. And once it evolves, eventually it is going to explode. When it finishes its fuel at the end of its life, the outer shells will explode and the inner shell will turn into a compact object. It could be a neutron star, it could be a black hole. Imagine it is a black hole. And the outer stuff has exploded in a supernova and it's deposited a lot of the stuff on this one. Now, this one is going to evolve in time over millions of years. And now, as it evolves, it is also going to expand and its outer layers will expand so far that this guy has more influence on it than this, this star, right? So, as it expands, it will lose mass to the other star. Remember, these are going around each other at these phenomenal speeds that Bala talked about, right? And this one has turned into a black hole. You can't see it anymore, by the way. And this star, which you can see, has evolved so much that its outer layers are less attracted by gravity to this object than the other object. And it's losing it. And this starts falling on the black hole. Now, it, it can go straight into the black hole, but the black hole has a limit to what it can eat. And in most such cases, it so happens that the mass that falls onto the black hole is much more than what it can eat. So, what happens if I give you more than you can eat? You start vomiting. In the case of the black hole, it does too, except that if it goes inside, it can't come out, unlike you where you vomit stuff that you have already ingested. But what will happen is that it will, there, it will accumulate around the black hole in a disk. It has to be a disk because it is already rotating. It has got angular momentum. It cannot get rid of it. And eventually, that is what it is going to look like. Artist's impression, that is the black hole, which is a black hole. I do not care whether I can see it or not, but what is around it is sitting in this curved space time around the black hole. It is trapped in there. And because the black hole's gravity is so strong, it is getting hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter in this stuff is 10 to the power 7 degrees hot around a black hole. And that is because the gravity is so strong, if you throw something at a black hole, it, it actually hits the surface, if there was one, of the black hole before going in. It is traveling 
at millions of kilometers per hour or actually even millions of uh, just about you know um, a tenth or a fiftieth or a hundredth of the speed of light. And so this stuff is going in there at very, very high speeds and as a result its temperature goes up. And when something is 10 to 7 degrees hot it emits x-rays. So the way to detect black holes we realized in the 50s and 60s is to find an x-ray telescope. These things do not emit optical radiation because optical radiation is emitted by things like the sun which are 6000 degrees hot or 5000 degrees hot, a few thousand degrees hot, not very hot at all. If something is a few hundred degrees hot it emits radio waves that is why you need radio telescopes. You want really high energy radiation you have to go to x-rays. So here is the stuff again artist impression falling into the black hole and what will happen is that the black hole starts to vomit and stuff comes out perpendicular to this disk in the form of a jet traveling close to the speed of light, right, relativistic stuff. So in order to detect these things, we are going to now getting into these large worldwide projects and we will talk about some of them which will look at these things. In the optical we are building and I will will not talk about this so I just wanted to mention it, the 30 meter telescope which is the largest telescope in the world now is 10 meters in, in diameter and to observe something like these out in space where you are looking at um, the optical counterparts of these things which are, will be very, very faint, you need much bigger telescopes. Um, I am not just talking of black holes in general. But um, so I just wanted to flash this up because I am not going to talk about this today. See how, the, how, how, how intricate this is. This has a mirror that is 30 meters across. 30 meters is the size of this auditorium, slightly more, more than that, much more than that. But what will happen is that um, you cannot build a mirror that large. Even now the 10 meter telescopes are not single mirrors. So this thing has 492 mirrors each of this size about a meter across hexagonal and we put together and each of these segments can move independently. The largest telescope in the world now is the same design, the Keck telescope, it has 72 mirrors like that, right. And to do that to actually find pinpoint sources that are very compact around individual stars like black holes, you need to have exquisite resolution and what happens is as light comes through our atmosphere, it um, it it it's distorted because it's, it comes through various layers being refracted before it comes to you and as the atmosphere itself moves the the uh, image gets blurred and so the resolution is affected in immensely if you're observing from the earth now these telescopes and some of this technology is now being developed at ayuka is, has something called adaptive optics where what you do is you have these mirrors that are moved in real time of the order of milliseconds. In order to compensate for this distortion in, the, in this atmosphere from which the information of which comes from a secondary telescope that is observing some, some star, some point object and it now it is possible through computers to do this, it tells the telescope how the, the object, the, this, this point object is moving in the sky and then the shape of the mirror is changed in real time to compensate for it. I am not going to talk about this, this is a fantastic technology and this will be built with this technology, already the Keck telescope uses this technology. The TMT is being built by these five countries. The mirrors are being made in China and Japan, I was talking to the Japanese counterparts only last week, the National NAOJ Director General had come over, they are making over, making these segments, we are polishing them and we are building the control system that goes under each segment to control each of these segments. It is being built by Indian industry and we are slowly identifying the people who will build these segments, right. Godridge has already started building some part of this in Mumbai, a company called Avsarala is building some part of this in Bangalore and we are starting to do this, right. And India is building the entire software of this telescope. A part of this being, is being built by Honeywell another part of it is built by ThoughtWorks and many of the other Pune and they are both entirely being done in Pune. This will start working in 2029. 
right? Long after I'll, I'll, I'll retire. But uh, so that's why I'm saying this is a, a project for young people. And uh, in Canada is building the dome, etc. It's going to go in Hawaii, right? Nothing like this. The largest telescope in India is three meters across. And we're dreaming of a 30 meter telescope that India is going to help build and be 10% partner in Hawaii. That's, that's the kind of stuff that's being built to go under each hexagonal mirror. The intricacy of this is amazing. These are all prototypes being built now. Right, so <clears throat> I told you, of course, I, I'll resume the story of black holes. When I, when I left it, to detect these things, you have to go into higher energies. You have to go into, because there are higher temperatures. Now you have the entire electromagnetic spectrum here. And if you look at this, it starts in a wavelength as wavelength goes smaller or frequency goes larger, the energy goes up of the photon. Okay. And what happens is our sun or stars, normal stars, emit here in the visible light. And you can see it's a very small fraction of this entire spectrum. This is on the log scale, by the way. Right? So here, these are, these are 10 to the power meters. So it goes from 10 to the power 3, 10 to the power 4, 10 to the power 5, 6, up to 10 to the power minus 16. And optical light is just only here. Now it so happens that our atmosphere is transparent only there. And a little bit in the radio. None of this comes through the atmosphere. Very good because it, you get skin cancer if it does. This is stopped by the ozone layer, right? But for astronomers, it's a killer. I just told you I want to observe black holes in x-rays. X-rays don't come through the atmosphere. So what do we do? We have to build a mirror that focuses x-rays. That I can't do. Why? As you know, you stand in front of an x-ray mirror, x-rays go through you. This is why. Why? I just showed you. If for example, the light that comes to a mirror has a wavelength that's comparable to the spacing in between the atoms, it will go through. Just, just like you kick a ball at the, the railing. If the ball is larger than the railing, it is reflected. If it's smaller, it goes through. Right? That's what happens with x-rays. So somebody came up with the idea, in order to reflect x-rays, what you need to do is to do this, right? And then, if you, if you throw a cricket ball at it, it will come back most of the time, right? So now, how are you going to reflect it? You're going to have a mirror built such that it's not reflected like this, but at grazing incidence, right? So X-ray imaging you know, really started in the 1980s and 1990s when the first such mirrors were built, as recent as this. Nobody thought this was possible. Now what we do, you can see the critical angle beyond which it goes through for gold, which is what we use, or, or silver, is of the order of a couple of degrees in the energies we are talking about, KV. So you have to make sure that things don't get more than a couple of degrees from the surface. And so you build long mirrors, right? So I worked, for example, for the Chandra X-ray Telescope, as was mentioned before, which works like this. So let's see if this works. And we're building these in India now. So as the things come in, you can see that you can nest them. So the X-rays will come, and they'll slowly be nudged and shepherded towards the detector. The camera will be there, and they'll be captured. And you can get the same effect as you have in the focus of a mirror, like an optical mirror, and that's your camera, right? NASA's Chandra, which was named after Chandra Shekhar, who first actually predicted there will be black holes. So in, in, in order to honor him, NASA named the telescope that's going to detect these black holes um, Chandra. And Chandra has four sets of nested X-ray mirrors, and uh, it has this long orbit that lasts 64 hours, not the Hubble Space Telescope or the space station, that's just a few hundred kilometers up there, and goes around every 90 minutes. This goes every 64 hours. That's because there's a lot of radiation around the Earth. You have to avoid all that and go very far away. And you can see how long that mirror is. That's 15 feet or 
five meters in length. And there you have, uh, you know, that, that's a simple shutter and you have the camera there. And there what you do is you can get the gas that falls into a black hole and you can catch them. Now there are two kinds of black holes. In each galaxy there's a very big massive black hole in the middle which is a few million times the mass of the sun. And then there are all these black holes in binary orbits I showed you everywhere, millions of them, right? And they are the same mass as the sun, a few times the mass of the sun. Because they come from stars, there's no star that is more than 100 times the mass of the sun. So they come from um, uh, these things that merge with each other and they come. And, and so you, you can detect black holes and stuff falling into the black holes and getting very hot and emitting x-rays from both the kinds of these black holes. So the one that's in the middle, there will be lots of gas that falls into the center of the galaxy and as they fall, fall, they will not be able to get into the black hole and jets will come out. This is the prediction. And similarly, you have these things uh, where a black hole is in orbit around another star and stuff will fall onto that black hole and it will emit x-ray radiation. So one of the things we did with the Chandra telescope was that we used, because we built it, we had guaranteed time. We said, let's pick a galaxy that's, that has a big black hole in the middle and lots of black holes all over it and observe it for the longest time ever. So we observed it for a million seconds and that's Centaurus A. This was done in the early years of the mission. I'm showing you old data, but this is, I mean, this is very interesting because this Centaurus A, this is a picture taken with an optical telescope from the Earth, right? And that's what it looks like. Nice galaxy is not far away from us, one of our nearest neighbors. And so you can get a good look at this. Now everything you see here is a few thousand degrees hot, right? Because they are optical. Chandra observing this with this technology of focusing um, uh, mirrors and the same image quality as any ground-based optical telescope gives us this. Whoops, what happened to it? I'm sorry. Okay, the punchline here is missing. Somehow this got deleted. Okay, so uh, sorry about that. But the Chandra telescope the image of this, I don't know what happened to it. Chandra telescope image of this actually shows um, that you have dotted all over the place these black holes and binary systems. And there are many hundreds of them. And in the middle, you see this jet coming out of the middle in x-rays, which uh, as predicted, which is the length of the whole length of the galaxy. Right? And all of that is a few million degrees hot. So you can do that. Somehow that slide got deleted. I'm sorry. But what I meant to say was that we are now, Chandra was the pioneer in, in doing this high resolution um, uh, X-ray imaging. Europe, the European Space Mission built another one called XMM Newton, which has the same mirrors, but not as high resolution. And then we built in India over the last 10 years or so, um, what was built was AstroSat. Now AstroSat is, has these telescopes in there. This one of the telescopes is a soft X-ray telescope that's built in TIFR Mumbai. AstroSat was launched three years ago and in the last three years it has been giving us amazing uh, images of these binary systems, many of them which have black holes. Um, in fact, today AstroSat, just now I heard, is observing one of them because it was such a system was found uh, this morning and we have these alerts that go out all over the world saying one, one of these things have been detected uh, in the um, x-rays by another telescope. Let's all observe it together. And so um, we can observe it because AstroSat has a fantastic uh, x-ray telescope that can actually image these things. Of course, Chandra and XMM also are working still. They were launched in 1999, but AstroSat has amazing um, uh, capability in looking at the time variability because it's got a response time which is very much shorter than the other ones. And so what it can do if it stares at something, it can build up how the object varies with a very small um, uh, time interval, which Chandra and XMM can't. And so 
what astrocyte is used is to look at the variability of objects, which actually tells us about the nature of objects. It also has an ultraviolet telescope, which is the best ever built. It's much better than the last one that NASA had called Galax and is doing very well. The science data from it has just started and it's now opened up to the entire world. The first two years, only Indians could use it and we've used it now to test its various capabilities. It's doing very well. The first nature papers and science papers are coming out. I'm not going to show you any results just yet, but you can actually look up on the web. But now it's now open to the world and we're getting applications from the entire world to use it. This is another example of, um, no, I'll just go. So what has happened is, towards the end of what I'm going to talk about is how the technology that India is getting into is now facing these challenges. And to do that, you need, really need to get into the big league. The style of doing research in India was in research un institutes that were set up outside universities, so no manpower, and with limited budgets. So the way we did science in India was in individual labs with very little collaboration amongst ourselves. So the, we worked on small projects. And individually, scientists would work with groups of, abroad and build up through individual grants and individual uh, initiative, big collaborations. But the government didn't actually help. The government didn't, wasn't interested in doing this. And there was very little connection between industry and these labs. Now what is happening is that over the last 10 years, we've got into these amazing big projects. And by big projects, mega projects, I mean India spending over $100 million on each of them. In many cases, many much more. In fact, for example, ITER, which India is about 6% part of for fusion research in France, India is committed to spending 25,000 crores. And uh, for LIGO India, be two to 3,000 crores. The 30 meter telescope I already showed you and stuff like that. So these are huge projects and these are to do with multinational big installations which ad will address some of these fundamental questions about the universe. And so in the last few minutes, I'm going to talk about, pick LIGO India and talk about something because it actually addresses one of the questions I raised um, and uh, which comes from Einstein's theory. And uh, of course, I'm also going to talk about because here in Pune, we are you know, one of the leaders in building this thing. It's not going to be very far from Pune. So this is getting high visibility. All these big projects that are coming in. This is Economic Times had a wonderful Sunday supplement um, uh, in, uh, in August, which did many pages of looking at how India is getting into all these different projects, LIGO, TMT, et cetera. Um, actually, it was come, came from initiative of Shashi Dhara, who's uh, at ISER Pune, who got the journalists together with some of us to actually go in depth and write these articles. So I'm glad that people are taking notice of what's happening in India. So what LIGO India will look like this. This is the one in, uh, in Hanford in, in Washington in the US. And it is something that has two four kilometer arms. What is it going to do? Four kilometer long arms. There are tubes in which the vacuum is going to be a nanotor which is about 10 to the power 10 times lower than the pressure in the atmosphere. And there'll be lasers bouncing in between. And of course, this, there are two LIGOs in the world, and they got the Nobel Prize for detecting the first gravitational wave uh, about three years ago. What is it? I told you that in um, Einstein's prediction of gravity was that space-time is a thing, and it gets distorted by mass, right? And so when masses move or collide in this space-time, they send out ripples in space, okay? And these ripples, Einstein immediately wrote a paper saying, these ripples are going to be so tiny, they'll never be observed. So please don't go looking for them. He, in, he you know, in, 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 instead talked about bending of light, et cetera. But 100 years later, they have been uh, detected, and India is getting into this in a big way. So this is what happens. You can, you, I showed you the space time, and what happens is that if, for example, two things are orbiting each other, like say two black holes, they will merge, and then uh, they will send out this, uh, this, this uh, um, ripples in space time. 
Now, I will give you an example of the quantity I just picked it out of my normal lecture on black holes, but uh, do not worry about what is written there. So, this is for example, you have two neutron stars going around or two black holes going around and as they merge, what will happen is that they are going around, they are in a binary system and many of them because they are, they have very strong gravity as soon as they get very close to each other, the space time curvature around them becomes so much that they get trapped in each other's orbits and they slowly merge. This is what happens. So, when that happens, the space time around them gets very violently moved in, in, in ripples and those ripples go out very far away. The gravitational waves we are, we are getting are from actually literally billions of light years away. But the amplitude of vibration of space time is this 10 to the power minus 21 in strain, which means that if you have a table like this that is detecting this gravitational wave or this chunk of space time, then the ratio in which they are compressed or expanded is 10 to the power minus 21. So, just imagine actually measuring something like that. So, that is why we are building this laser system that is 4 kilometers across. So, which means that we will have to detect it shrinking and expanding as a result of these ripples by 10 to the power minus 18 meters. Why 4 kilometers? Because that is the biggest straight line you can actually build due to the curvature of space. A curvature of sorry, not space, but at the earth. You have two mirrors which are kind of this big, and you fire a laser at it from one to another. If it is more than about few kilometers long, then the curvature of the earth means you will miss the mirror. So, you have to have very different kind of uh, optics to do that. So, how small is this 10 to the 18 meters? Right? So, nuclear diameter is 10 to the minus 15 meters. So, if you are looking at detecting a distortion of space time that is 1000 times smaller than the nucleus of the atom. And imagine that has been done. And we have to do it in India, where our Godridge, you know, cupboards do not close properly. <laughs> <laughs> so, that is the challenge, right. So, the idea is, is very simple. I will be very brief. I know I am running out of time. But um, the idea is that if you have some masses placed around this, then as the ripple goes through space time, they contract in one way and expand in the other, right? And that is the signature of a gravitational wave. So, this is what will happen. You have a very, very simple interferometer, which is called a Michelson interferometer, which you use in physics all the time. And you have a laser that is split into two beams that go perpendicular to each other. And when, if their paths are identical, then they produce a set of fringes that are in equilibrium. And as a gravitational wave passes like this, one of them will be expanded and the other will be contracted and so they will go slightly out of phase. And, and so, your fringes will tell you that something has passed and you can multiply this effect by making this as long as possible. In fact, what we do is in each arm there is a cavity in which the laser goes about 400 times back and forth and so, you multiply that effect. Eventually, you will have to beat what is called noise. If I stand here and jump, I produce a much more vibration than what will happen if uh, two black holes merge billions of light years away. In fact, when the first LIGO detection happened, we spent about two months worrying whether we had detected a lightning strike in Nairobi from the west coast of the US because it happened exactly the same time. We had to monitor everything all over the world. It of course will detect in when we build one in Maharashtra you detect every wave that strikes both coasts of India, right? <laughs> every wave. But we know what a wave looks like in these, in, in, the, in, in this time series. So, we can eliminate them straight away. <clears throat> so, right now, you have two of these that are separated by 3000 kilometers and these have detected gravitational waves and there is a third one in Italy now. So, what happened was, the first two that were detected in September 2015 look like this. Imagine this is about a fifth of a second, the time series. And what you what you're looking at is the strain, which means the compression. And what happens for two black holes merging, I didn't want to show you the movie because it will take a lot of time, is that they come very close to each other and they merge. So, when they're far apart, the ripple that they're producing has a 
has a frequency that's large, and as they get closer and closer and closer, they get faster and faster, and those the frequency decreases, and then they merge here. So you can see the frequency is large there, and then slowly they come. So if you look at, think of it in terms of a sound, the pitch will go up, right? It's, it, the pitch will go up. This is the frequency that goes up. That's called a chirp. Yeah, all of us have these uh, um, ringtones on our mobile phones where it goes, goes, goes up. And that, that's the signature of a gravitational wave, because that can be produced by other things. And so you have to eliminate everything like that. And so these were the first two. And this was seven, seven milliseconds um, uh, after the one, this, this was detected by Livingston, seven milliseconds after Hanford. And so we could even find where it was coming from, approximately. When we get one in India, we can pinpoint these things much better. So one of our students drew this wonderful picture. I to, told you the black holes have a size, which is related to the mass, 2 gm over c squared. So the two black holes that were first detected were 20, about 30 times the mass of the sun, merging to become something that's 60 times the mass of the sun. Their size, the Schwarzschild radius, the actual size of that black hole would be the size of a state in India, right? So these two, the state, maybe a shape of Karnataka and the shape of both Andhra Pradesh and Telangana together, merge together to have a Madhya Pradesh sized black hole, right? And in that merger, we could see that about two times the mass of the sun was lost because the mass of the end was more than the mass of collective mass of the first two, and that's radiated as gravitational energy equals mc squared. Simple. Now, as of yesterday, <coughs> we know of 10 such. You know that recently there were quite a few that were released. We have 10 pairs of black holes that we know of that have been detected by the two LIGO missions. They, in, this is times the mass of the sun, 20, 40, 80. There's one that has just been announced where two of these gives something 80 times the mass of the sun, a black hole. All these are the black holes that we've found from Chandra XMM and Astrosat, all these uh, X-ray telescopes. So you can see from X-ray telescopes in binary orbits, we get these things. But from gravitational waves, we're getting these things. We don't get these from these. So you can see we're actually getting a different class of black holes. We didn't know that black holes this massive existed before. So that's one thing that LIGO is giving us. And very soon we'll figure out, this thing will fill up and we'll figure out what kinds of black holes there are. So there are two different messages. The other thing that is happening is that we are directly detecting gravity from something. We are not worried about whether it emits light or X-rays or anything. Most things in the universe don't emit light or X-rays or any, any form of electromagnetic radiation. But everybody has gravity. So this discovery opens up a totally new way of looking at the universe. I'm looking at mass, which everybody has. Only a few of these stars or galaxies have light, right? So we directly detect the universe. And so when it becomes gravitational wave astronomy, when we have millions of these objects, then we start looking at the universe in a completely different way. Just like this is so exciting as if we were next to Galileo when we first saw the the first astronomical phenomenon through a telescope. And then suddenly, astronomy became a reality. So these two exist. Virgo has started working in Italy. The last discovery happened, all three of them together, so they could actually minimize the area from which they can find the object. But still, we can't really locate an object through this method, because the area that the uncertainty of position, due to even three detecting it, is of the order of 600 square degrees. The moon is one fourth of a square degree. So you can see how big it is. So even if you then take a telescope and start looking for X-ray emission from them, it's impossible. With LIGO India operating, and there's one in coming up in Japan called Kagura, that thing will come down to two square degrees, that uncertainty, or one square degree. And then after each event, we'll be able to actually look at a telescope and scan that area to figure out whether we have detected anything, okay? that kind of stuff. Now the uncertainty is so much, and we'll go with, with LIGO India there. This is the kind of technology that we'll have to build inside. I'm taking pictures from within the LIGO tunnels now. And if you look at the technological challenges of building a vacuum system, which is the only other vacuum system that is so rare is the CERN collider. And, um, 
and within there, you have to build things that are so sensitive that's completely isolated from any vibration anywhere. Right? So now we're looking at air conditioners in the building that we will be able to completely characterize such that the vibrations from them you know, will, will be totally known so that that won't affect the signal. Not, not just that, every single aspect of this in there. This kind of technology, India doesn't do. There are no large scale facilities, scientific facilities in India that on Indian soil does this. But when we build this, of course, you know, Indian PhD students don't need to go abroad. You will find people will come from the US to do their PhDs here. Right now, the institutes that are building these are um, these four. The, the place that it's going to be built is here in the Hingoli district in Maharashtra. And uh, we have uh, the Institute of Plasma Research in Gandhinagar building the vacuum. Desi they've, uh, they've worked on the design already. Um, the Raja Ramana Center in Indore, RRCAT, is building the entire laser systems. And Ayuka is in charge of the computation. So we have, we'll have our HPC system that's built so slowly up for the data reduction and, and archiving of everything, as well as the basic science of the, of the uh, operation. So after it is built, Ayuka will run the whole show from, from Pune. We'll, of course, have an outstation there. And uh, we are now building the manpower. So we are going to all the universities, getting them together to see the associated research, whether it's done in the universities and institutes. So Ayuka is coordinating everything. And there, ICER Pune plays a very, very important role because one of the major systems is being done in ICER Pune. So this is what it's like. And um, uh, we've now, the green part is forest land, where we've identified this place in the Hingoli district. It's un unforested forest department land, so no trees will be cut. But right now, we're trying to get the environment clearance through government. It's almost done. And I have to go there and, and talk to the people there. The pink part are actually farmers owning grazing land. And there are small parts of it. So there are 40 different farmers we are negotiating with right now. For land acquisition, uh, the chief minister of Maharashtra has already given us this bit, which is the state government land. This is what it looks like right now. That's where the two arms are going to meet. That's Tarun Saradip from Ayuka. And, and we'll have to build the straight tunnels through this kind of territory. So a lot of cutting and filling will happen. Right? It's very important. I mean, we went that day for the trivial purpose of figuring out whether the two arms will be in 90 degrees, PWD had already marked it out and it got it wrong. We found it was 89.5. <laughs> and we took our GPS of our institute and went around <laughs> and did the right. So that kind of stuff we're doing now. It's so exciting. And we are now, essentially, this is as of end of August. We are digging in there to do the geotechnical survey to figure out how much rock is basalt how much cutting we'll have to do, what kind of equipment we need. That is the state we are now, right now. In 2025, we have to detect gravitational waves, right? So it's a huge job. All this stuff we have to do in India, because we have to do all the developments that the Americans will do in the next six, seven years here in India, because they're going to give us a set that they built along with the other LIGO, the mirrors, the laser, they're coming to us. That's a donation. But the rest of it we have to do. And that's why it's a 3,000 crore project. And all this will be done in Indian universities and in, with Indian industry. Right? And we're already starting this dialogue. In fact, on the 19th of January, um, we have the first LIGO India industry meet in Pune, where people who will get involved in such things will come and talk to us. That's only the first. And we're also doing as part of our outreach program. This is my last slide. We also think this is one of the most backward areas in Maharashtra right now, in the country actually, in terms of basic education. And we believe that you cannot build a facility like this in India without engaging with the population there. So we have a massive outreach program that has started with the schools in that area, where we're going and working with the schools, with their science education, and in Hingoli district and neighboring districts in Palwani, in Latur, and various other places. And this, as you can see, already, I don't know whether you can see, some of them are doing the L-shaped stuff. They're all being talk, talked about LIGO, the L coming to them. I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>